point, when we have some questions coming in, and I'm happy to use those as a launching point. We've got, just being mindful of the time, about 20 minutes. If there's anything formal that Peter or Dr. Bashir wanted to add. Um. <laughs> I, let's go to questions. Lots to say. Let's go to questions. Sure. Okay, great. So, so some of this, um, I, you know, I'll read through these questions. Some of them have been addressed already. Maybe we could just sort of summarize these so we can get into kind of the meat of a discussion. Um, the first one that came in, what is the difference between palliative care and MAID? Is it just about the timeline slash process, or is it more than that? You, you spoke to that a lot, Dr. Barwich, but maybe you could just encapsulate that for the, for the question. So at this time, palliative care does not hasten death, so it would not be something that a palliative care provider traditionally would provide. Uh, medical assistance in dying is hastening death, either through a uh, prescription that the person ingests by themselves, provided by a physician or by a physician injecting a, a series of medications which will usually produce death within 15 minutes. So it's quite different in terms of its approach. So th this one may sort of spell that out a little bit further. Um, is this the same as euthanasia? Yeah. In a word, yes. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, it has legally two descriptors. There's a voluntary euthanasia and assisted suicide. And arguably, when the f when the practitioner is administering it, that's voluntary euthanasia. And when the patient self-administers, it's uh, assisted suicide. Okay. I have a few more on the screen, but it'd be great to get someone standing up. Any questions? Oh, perfect. <coughs> Dr. Schwartz. I was going to type it, but it was faster to speak. Um, so in renal, I feel like we've been doing passive euthanasia for, for a long, long time, in that we withhold dialysis from those patients who've decided to stop. Um, and this has been a, a mainstay of our practice and part of our palliative care. One of the things that always struck me is that for patients who are dying of something like a cancer, uh, who know their time is short, we've often, I feel, um, forced them to fit within our construct of palliative care and that if you need hospice care that precludes dialysis. And we've met many patients who feel they're not ready to go, but they want the care they need as they know the cancer will take them. Um, I'm wondering if there's any thoughts on how we address those patients who want supportive palliative care, often in a residential type facility, but also aren't yet ready to stop dialysis. Sounds like a resource issue. Yeah, I think, I think at this point, um, hospices were developed to meet a specific identified need for people who are fairly stable in, in the last weeks of life. But certainly as we're kind of trying to integrate a palliative approach to care, it's becoming obvious we need to do something about these other populations. So do we work with you to improve the environments in your care settings to be able to provide better end of life care? I think certainly Dr. Krim has led a, a steering group around end-of-life care that's tried to do that. Or do we build sort of purpose-built hospices that have the option for more, like some, there's residential care facilities that have ventilated patients now, right? So do we build some um, additional options in, in terms of uh, resources? Sounds like we might need to do that. Um, another question that was asked here is if nurses are going to be involved in the administration of the medications and are the nurses able to say no to their involvement in administering medication? Um, yes, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not speaking for the College of Registered Nurses, but um, nurses actually wouldn't administer the medication. Uh, nurse practitioners are authorized to administer the medication and that's within their, within their scope of practice, but a nurse would, would largely be limited to establishing the IV and, and that end of it. And um, I think that uh, it's really a discussion that nursing staff need to have with their employer because it's an employer issue. Um, I believe that the respect for autonomy and respect for conscientious objection exists within the nurse College of Registered Nurses Practice Guidelines, but I believe it, it, it engages the employer aspect as well. And I know that they have great guidance on their website for any RNs who'd like to know what they should or shouldn't be doing. Uh, please go to your uh, uh, regulator website. They have uh, standards of practice. So who are those nurse practitioners? The, um, a nurse practitioner is a nurse 
first and then has additional training to be qualified as a nurse right. practitioner. Did, did I understand you correctly that you said a nurse practitioner would administer the medication? Yep. It's any nurse practitioner then. It's, it's not uh, someone with a particular training in this. Name. So, yeah, so um, the, the, that's why it's called medical assistance in dying as opposed to physician assistance in dying because uh, nurse practitioners are authorized under the federal uh, statute as well as the provincial statute. So basically the, the actual last bit of regulatory amendments only came through probably just about six weeks ago, but nurse practitioners are authorized, providing they have appropriate training to, to both assess patients for medical assistance in dying as well as provide that, and they have the prescriptive authority to do that as well. So I don't know that there's many nurse practitioners doing that, but there are some. Um, but they are uh, enabled under the existing legislation, whereas a nurse may not administer the medication. It, whoever whoever's writing the prescription needs to administer that sort of the, the part and parcel. And of course, a physician could administer the medication. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Stab, so I'm trying to figure out when do, when do I sort of, sort of step in to say something. So this is a, a lovely opportunity, because the question is. You know, what are the rules around uh, what different types of practitioners can and cannot do? And the first thing I want to say is that, you know, there are different frames that we can look at in thinking about MAID. There's a legal framework, there's a regulatory framework, and there's an ethics framework. And the ethics framework can be reduced to the legal framework or the regulatory framework. From my perspective, the appropriate ethics framework is one of integrity. And, and I want to just take a moment, if I may, and just sort of step back. And say, what happened? Uh, depending on how old you are and how long you've been practicing, for many years, we have been taught uh, that there's a very important line not to cross. It's taboo to cross that. Overnight, we've been told, not only is it okay to cross that, but you may be obliged to do, to participate in that. So our integrity is all of a sudden on the line in a very important way. We have to follow the law, we have to follow our professional standards, but we're human beings and guided by all kinds of other values as well. And if you're like me, often what happens is when you see a truck coming, you do get caught like a deer in headlights, and you watch that truck. And all of a sudden it's too late and it's hit you and you haven't actually thought about what the heck should I do? And I think for us, many of us, it's come to pass. And what's happened for us is we have to figure out how should we respond to this situation? The law says, well, you've got to do this. There are regulations very helpful that say you've got to do this. But as human beings, we, have to, we all of a sudden now have to do some really hard work to reflect, well, where do I stand in all of this? If I'm asked to participate on a team that's going to be doing this, how should I react? Should I not participate? Should I participate? How do I think about this? And uh, so what I want to say is that the ethics approach, the integrity approach, that requires a couple of things. One, it requires that all of us participate in some active self-reflection. We all need to now think about where do we stand. We have to do it now because we may be involved, implicated in this act, whether or not we're comfortable participating. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to suggest is that as we think about the, everyone's got their own responsibilities formally, but we have to work as teams. And I would strongly suggest that one of the most important things we need to do is figure out how are we going to work as interdisciplinary teams, interprofessional teams, with different amounts of power, with different legal responsibilities, as we are going to engage this stuff. Because if we don't do that, we're gonna run into a lot of trouble. The third thing I want to say, and I'll, then I'll be quiet, uh, is that I think that we need to take the ethics approach, the integrity approach, is about asking what should matter as we respond to the situations that we face, as we respond to the kinds of uh, cases that Dr. Ukraine pointed to. And I want to name that there are a lot of things at stake. We have a duty to care and not abandon our patients. We have to respect our patients' dignity enable them to make autonomous choices, but more than that, help them to actually understand what a dignified life looks like. We need to advance patient well-being, which means helping them have a good, a good death in this case, many cases. We have to respect the integrity of our healthcare providers. We have to be, we're committed to excellence in professional practice. We want to advance the well-being of our families. We want to demonstrate respect for our families. As organizations, we have to demonstrate integrity. 
We have to build trust in the micro setting between our patients and families and our teams, but with the public and the health system at large. We have to make good decisions. We have to attend to care for the vulnerable, making sure that there's attention to social justice and equity. We have to be good stewards of our institutions and our public health care system. And at the end of the day, this is all about the public good. My point is simply that there's a lot at stake. And we, it's, we can't narrow it down to a simple thing that we need to do. We actually need to step back as teams, as human beings, as professionals, and ask ourselves, what really matters here? And practically, in my context, with my team, how am I going to live up to this stuff in the new reality? And I think that's the broad challenge that's before us. Thank you. Um, and Peter, I saw you nodding your head. I thought this might be a nice time yeah. for you to get into the it's discussion. It's a marvelous segue, <laughs> marvelous segue. <laughs> You talk about uh, this line in the sand that is totally taboo in the land of spirituality and in the land of, well, with the overlap with religious. I mean, it's not just taboo, it's, you know, <laughs> burning in hell forever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love what you said about how we need to reflect and how we need to work as teams. Um, I see that on some of the units, I see the team coming together very well. I see sometimes real scrambles when, when something drops in really fast. I hear of, of uh, well, I'm thinking of a social worker who is just morally opposed to the whole idea of medical assistance in dying. She's told her supervisor and has said, what do I do if this lands on my floor? And got nothing, you know, it's just an abandonment. In spiritual care, it's certainly an issue. There's not that I know of any clear decision that, that spiritual health practitioners have taken on this issue. It's, it's something we talk about. It's something we struggle with. We default, I think, all of us default to our, our need, our, our calling to serve, to help, to offer support to offer support where we can and to, to step back when we can't and to find someone else. But I, I certainly agree with, with our need to reflect. You're right, it, it, it's pushed through like a, leg, uh, as a piece of legislation and uh, I'm, well, I don't know. It's like the baby has landed in the nurse's hands and you know we haven't done any prenatal work, <laughs> but I'm hoping I'm hoping that uh, people can come together on this. I know patients, certainly renal patients, almost all of them have considered this issue. You know, you, one step removed in terms of withdrawing care, stopping dialysis. It's something. Some of them like to talk about a lot. Some of them will talk about once and never approach it again. All of our calling is to be there to listen, to hear them, to be with them, to support them as best we can. Thank you. Another question here? Thanks. Um, I guess with such a, an emotionally charged topic, um, I'm hearing about more and more interest in patient reported outcome measures and other ways to actually measure the patient's experience and as, I guess, as part of a decision-making tool. Um, so I just wanted to ask the panel to, to comment on that as a, an appropriate tool and if there's any other related tools um, for, for providers to kind of collect information and, and document the process towards. Thanks. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I mean, I can attempt an answer. I don't think that, that at this point in time, we are collecting qualitative information in terms of end-of-life care with patients. But if you would ask me about something that is vital for us to do, it is to start collecting that information and collecting it in a systematic manner so that it, it comes back to this patient-reported outcome and patient-reported experience measures and measures around, um, around dying and quality of dying. There is certainly work that has been done in, in other disciplines. Uh, Doris, there's a fair amount of work, I gather, in, in, this, in the experience of dying. And, but 
my sense is that at least here provincially from the renal standpoint, it's something that we've talked about but have not yet embarked on. I, I certainly think that there's a great need for those tasked with uh, delivering health care, and I'm going to say the government, to have uh, reporting frameworks and they need to collect data. It needs to be meaningful and there needs to be public reporting because this, again, this is a societal change. It's public policy change and that deserves public reporting. But I would say that we're still a long way from, from being there. Uh, while we're talking about documentation, there's kind of a literal question here about documentation and that's, um, is it being incorporated? How is it being incorporated into our advanced care planning? Um, and how does it relate to advanced care planning in terms of documentation? Um, I, first of all, it, uh, requesting medical assistance in dying cannot be in an advanced care plan. Um, it can't be put into an advanced directive. I think it is, I mean, in, in an ideal circumstance, you would have a patient who has a longitudinal relationship with somebody and they would know their pre-expressed wishes, their values, their beliefs, that's what that's what good family practice is, um, but uh, it, it can't be in an advanced care plan to the extent that when you're unable to make your own decisions or have somebody make substitute decision making around you, it can't be in that. So we're about to roll out from the centre a serious illness conversation uh, initiative which was started by Tolga Wandi's lab in, in uh, Boston as a way of, um, in, within a system of care routinely um, integrating questions that position care in terms of the person, their goals, their values, their beliefs, their fears, their priorities, the trade-offs they're prepared to make, etc. So um, stay tuned. We're just, uh, Dr. Bernacki from Harvard is coming in November 7th. We'll be having levels with high-level people and all the health authorities and then um, very soon be training people to, to do training around this. I mean, I think I think for me where I land with this, you know, I think all of us are sort of at a personal level for or against or whatever, but within a health system where this is one of the options, I think from my point of view, the best we can do is to provide really good care and there will still be some people who want this and then to make sure they get to the people who can help them with that. But in the meantime, let's, let's be better at identifying goals of care. Let's be better at normalizing for people that they are important and how do we integrate that. And what we, because I think we can become overly focused on disease and not enough on the person. So it's, it's kind of a correction and so it's part of our advanced care planning, moving it from just up, you know, upstream kind of before anything happens, decision making, there's a revised my voice coming within the next few months, the serious illness conversation and then, and we're doing uh, training in the public sphere as well and then some specific uh, rollout of training people to teach people how to think about end of life uh, options and choices and so forth. So we're doing a lot more in the public sphere to make people aware of what their options are um, and trying to make that person centered. And then whatever they decide from there, that really is their choice and then we need to make sure that they're supported around that or not, however we are, you know, whatever our role in the continuum of care is, right? So, so I think we had one uh, question here and perhaps I can make this in the interest of time, the last question. Um, yeah, I just had a question around, uh, this conversation reminds me about um, abortion rights and what people's stance was on that and I'm wondering how much um, that history has impacted decisions now and in terms of the health professional's role and responsibilities. Sorry, I'm, I'm so legally focused, but obviously ab abortion, used, ab abortion used to be illegal, right? I'm sure if we all look back through our families and generations, there were people who died from back alley abortions, right? So it became a lawful medical service. That's about the only parallel I can bring here. Um, uh, but I think that, again, it, it is fun fundamentally legal about what's considered legal or, or a legal service. Uh, following societal's values and, and what, they, what they want. So um, you don't have to, I mean, if you look around the world, this is not everywhere, right? Um, and it, it, we, we elect people to make decisions on our behalf. Um, my initial thought when 
Dr. Karim started speaking uh, an, uh, nearly an hour ago here was, thank goodness I'm not the only one feeling overwhelmed. <laughs> but okay, just take the stage. And, and we've heard that from the rest of the panel today. Um, and, and I think clearly from the questions in the audience, I think we're gonna move forward with this. Um, it's gonna be time interesting and sometimes challenging cases and transitions and we'll learn. And I think this is probably something that's a, a really good topic to come back and readdress in a couple years when we have some collective experience with it and some further thoughts. So I wanna th um, thank our panel for coming and contributing to such a great discussion and thank you everyone for um, the questions um, and uh, helping to stimulate that discussion. Thank you.